In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you for how you've been blessing us. Thank you for how you send your messages through your servants. And thank you for the great things you are doing in every heart. We pray, O oh Lord, that as you walk in us, we'll go back to our various locations. You'll walk through us in Jesus' name. We pray that the things you do here in every heart or the permanent in Jesus' name. We pray that as we come before your word again now, that your spirit will open the pages of scriptures to us so we'll be able to behold what's the mind of God for this hour through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. We're still continuing with our study of Second Timothy. Already the Lord has seen us through chapter 1. And you will remember that the Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy, his son in the faith, or his dearly beloved son. He was writing to him not just a personal letter but a pastoral epistle he was writing to him with the authority of an apostle with the affection of a friend with the appreciation of somebody wanting to encourage with the affirmation of somebody who wanted to support him and motivate him for further ministry he wanted to tell him that already he had the gift of God in him. But the gift of God in him will not do much if he maintained the spirit of fear or timidity. Therefore, he needed to stir up the gift of God in him. And he needed to be willing to suffer if need be so that he'll raise up a ministry that will be effective. He motivated him that he should continue to minister without any attitude or disposition of shame or fear of man. He also wanted him to minister without compromise, holding fast to the word of truth, the word of God, which he had heard and known. He also showed him that by his own life, many, many people had abandoned him and he left him in chains. Although a few people had sought him out to be able to help him and encourage him. But he wanted to impress it upon Timothy that whoever comes near, whoever detaches himself, whoever fellowships with us, or withdraws from us, we should keep attached to the word of God, preach it to the very end. And so he wanted Timothy to be strong, not strong in himself, not strong in natural ability. He wanted him to be strong in the Lord, in particular in the grace of the Lord. And he showed him how to do that by giving him symbols that he could easily relate with. He gave him the symbol of a teacher. And that as a teacher, he will keep the truth, get the truth. Not only that, he will pass it on to other people. He also wanted him to know that the Lord has called him to be a soldier, not just an ordinary soldier, a good soldier of Jesus Christ that will function well that will fulfill the role of an effective minister with nobility, with efficiency, that will determine that he will do what the Lord wanted him to do. In fact, he wanted him to be heroic. He also showed him that he was like an athlete, determined to win, putting forth much effort, and manifesting sacrifice and self-denial. 
he wanted him to understand that without those qualities and characteristics in the life of an athlete being present in the life of a minister, he will not be able to do much. And then he gave him a familiar symbol, a familiar image, that of a farmer. That he is a farmer that knows that he needs to feed his nation. Feeding his nation then will, deter, will uh, entail is going to his farm. He'll go early in the morning. He'll come back late in the night. He'll fight against the pests and the insects. He will walk against the weathers. Even when things are against him, he will make sure that he keeps the goal and the purpose in mind that he is raising crop to feed his nation. And that we are being called Timothy had been called and we have been called also that we are to feed the people with the word of God. We therefore need those characteristics in our lives. And then he told him, consider those things I've said. And while you are considering them, remember our perfect example, the Lord Jesus Christ. He suffered that we might be saved. He bore the cross that he might wear the crown. He died that he might rise up again. And because of what he has done, because of the model, the example he has set for us, Timothy, you need to rise up as well and be willing to suffer all things for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain life eternal, salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he wanted him to understand, not every preacher is going to stand by the word of God. And therefore, Timothy will have to shun profane and vain babblings. He'll need to avoid the people that were not keeping to the word of God. In fact, he was to study, to show himself approved unto God, a man that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He concluded chapter 2 by telling him in a great house, you have various kinds of vessels, some to honor, some to dishonor. And he wanted Timothy to make himself available in the hands of God that he might be a vessel unto honor, purged, sanctified, prepared, meet for the master's use. Now, he wants to tell Timothy that the time he was living in and the time we are living in was in fact a peculiar time. And he wanted to show Timothy the peculiarities of that time and what will help him to be an effective minister. And he was going to assure Timothy that, Timothy, it's already in you. It's the word of life, the word of faith, the word of truth, which you already have in you. In fact, you add it from your infancy, from the time you were very young. And that is the scriptures. Look at uh, chapter 3 and verse 15. And as for me, child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it's profitable, profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof and for instruction in righteousness. And so he wanted Timothy to know the instrument we actually need, the tool we need to be able to bring people into the kingdom of God you have already. He showed him in chapter 1, you have the spirit of God. He showed him you have an example, a model, a mentor. You have the teacher, you have an apostle, and you have a preacher. Now he says you have the scripture. Everything you need to be able to do the work, you already have. But then he told him you're living in a special time. Chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. If you connect those things together that I just mentioned to you now, the ministry of the scripture and the period in which Timothy was ministering. You then understand the reason why the title of our subject is the ministry of inspired scriptures in perilous times. The ministry of inspired scriptures in perilous times. Look at verse 1 again. This no also. He said I've told you many things yet I've not told you everything. This you still an up to know. You need to add this to the deposit of knowledge and understanding that you already have. This know also that in the last days, perilous times 
shall come. He put this in form of prophecy. He said, it shall come. He had given him this kind of prophecy in the first epistle to Timothy. Look at first epistle to Timothy chapter 4. And in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So Timothy was hearing for the second time. He had read it in the first epistle, that in the latter times, in the latter days, there will be perilous times, there will be difficult times, and uh, the spirit of the devil and demons will be walking to uh, corrupt the watch of God. He told him again now, he said, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now I could just have explained to you and I could have said, perilous times are here, difficult times are here, hard times are here. And I could have told you that it will happen in the last days. And then leave it in your hands to say what the last days mean. But it may not mean exactly what you are thinking. Because, you see, as we look at the scriptures, we see that the expression, the last days, or the latter times, or the latter days, they actually have varied meanings in scripture. And let's just go through some scriptures for you to understand the extent and the scope of the latter days or the last days. Please turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, that maketh known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and thy visions, the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And then he related to Nebuchadnezzar the dream he had forgotten. And do you know the meaning and the interpretation of the dream? He told him, you are now an emperor, a king, having a kingdom. Others are going to come after you, the Medo Persians. Others are going to come after that, the Grecian people. Others are going to come after that, the Roman government. And then Daniel was telling uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he said, Do you see all these things that are happening that you have seen? The very span of those four empires, they span the last days or the latter times. So, in the sense in which uh, Daniel used the words, the latter days, he meant the entire sweep of history from the time of Nebuchadnezzar to the time in verse 44 when God, the God of heaven, shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verses 1 and 2. See this, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. You see this expression here now, in these last days. Now, obviously, the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews is including the period in which he was living among the last days because he said he is now speaking to us by his son in these last days. Look at First John chapter 2 verse 18. First John chapter 2 verse 18. Little children, it's the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even know are there many antichrists whereby we know it is the last time you know what john is doing here john is including the time in which he lived the period of the church the entire period of the church age as the last days you understand that because you see this is the last dispensation this is the last period before the setting up of the everlasting kingdom of the Lord. And because of that, the time in which we're living. In fact, it started at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, at the time of the apostles, and all those periods to the time we're living in now have been included in the time of the last days. In First Peter chapter 1, First Peter chapter 1, in verse 20, 
it tells us who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. He, as Peter was talking to his own audience, he said, the last days are here upon you. He told them, when we talk of the last days, it includes the time in which you are living. So then you understand, there is a general sense, and we see it in scripture, by which uh, we include the whole of the church period, the whole of the church age, as the last days. And yet, you know, there are the last moments of the last days. And uh, the scripture uses the expression in that way also. When he talks of the last days, we go to Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24 and in verse um, 14. Numbers 24, 14. And now behold, I go unto my people. Balaam was telling Balak, come therefore and I will advertise thee. What these people shall do to thy people in the latter days. Balak was listening to Balaam. And he said, you see these people that cover your land? You see them moving on and they are going to the land of Canaan? They have a future. And there is something going to happen in the latter days. In fact, the trouble and the conflict between you and them now, or between them and you now, is not going to terminate here. Within your lifetime, there is going to be a future time. And now, I'm going to show you, advertise to you, I'm going to publicize to you what these people will do to your people in the latter days. And as uh, Balaam was revealing those things, he became himself so shocked in verse 23. And he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? He looked at the very far end of the last days, of the latter times, and he said, Balaam, I, Balak, I can't believe what I see. Alas, who will live when God begins to do this? In Jude verse 18. Jude verse 18. Here we have another uh, understanding or we have a more explanation on the last days. It says in verse 18 of Jude, how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. You have seen very clearly that uh, there is a sense in which the whole of the church period, the whole of the church age, is called uh, the, the latter times or the last days. And uh, also there is a last part of the latter days. And as uh, Paul the Apostle was talking to Timothy or writing to Timothy, please come back to chapter 3 and verse 1. He said, Timothy, and he said, by extension, he's talking to you and talking to me. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And then he begins to describe the characteristics of the people of the latter times, of the last days. And then he was encouraging the minister as well and encouraging us on what uh, we should be doing, how we should be doing the work of God in those last days in our own time. And uh, what place and what role and what function the scripture will have in our ministry at such a time. I've divided the chapter into three parts. Part number one, marks of self-centeredness in the church. Point one, marks of self-centeredness in the church. Point two, model for saints in God's service. Model for saints in God's service. Three, ministry of scriptures in the church. Let's look at number one, the marks of self-centeredness. Please look at it from verse two. You will discover, by the way, that verse two to verse five form a very long sentence. Because you see at the end of verse two, you have a comma, not a full stop. At the end of verse three, another comma there, not a full stop. And in, at the end of verse 4, a semicolon. And at the end of verse 5, you have a full stop. 
that means you have uh, these white lists were being given as the marks and the characteristics of this of self-centeredness now as i read the list to you and look at it it says for men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful unholy without natural affection truth breakers false accusers incontinent fears despisers of those that are good traitors heady high-minded lovers of pleasures more than lovers of god let me stop there for a moment now i want you i want you to notice something at the beginning of verse 2 it says men shall be lovers of their own selves and then he goes to give us the marks and the characteristics and then at the end of verse 4 he says they'll be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of god it, it's like you have a bracket and uh, the opening of the bracket the thing that starts the bracket there'll be men who are lovers of themselves and then you have such and such such and such such and such and then you close the bracket with men who are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of god now as you look at the list you will say how dare we say this is in the church is this not something that we find in the world is this not the spiritual condition is this not the moral condition of the people who do not know the lord of the people who are totally in the world of the people who are separated from the lord we say yes but then look at what the spirit of god is telling us in verse 5 having a form of godliness they go to church they're religious people they are nominal christians they have the name that they are associated with god in one way or the other they have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof it's in the church look at verse 7 ever learning they come to fellowship ever learning they read the bible ever learning they should say they have a kind of practice of religion ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth never able to come to the knowledge of the truth therefore that's why we say this point one is not just the mark of uh, self-centeredness in the world or in our society it's the self it's self-righteousness in the church in the church and it's unfortunate when the things that ought to be the mark and the characteristic of the world is found in the church the great contributing factor to the peril of the last days in the church will be self-centeredness i've shown you already it is a misdirected love and you know misdirected love always produces sin misdirected love always produces sin it's like when you dethrone the lord and you do not put the lord you do not have the lord where he belongs and you do not love him with all your heart all your soul and all your mind you do not love his word the way you ought to you do not appreciate his plan of redemption the way you ought to and then you misdirect your love it's going to produce sin in your life and then he gives us the offshoot he gives us the branches he gives us the fruits growing from the tree or from the root or on the root of self-centeredness and look at the list here it says men shall be lovers of their own selves that's the primary thing that's the very root of sin that's the thing that produces all the other things what are the things it will produce uh, it says covetous that means they will be lovers of silver lovers of money there will be inordinate affection for money inordinate affection for what money represents and when you find a person that has money above any other thing in life that is goal is just money he puts money above christ he puts money above the service of the lord he puts money above god 
he puts money above any other thing. Every other thing is running after it. He wants it at all costs. Even though he's in the church, you have the love of money, the desire to have money uppermost in his heart. Self is at the root of it. In fact, he thinks that gain is godliness. He thinks that godliness is gain. He thinks that if you're going to practice religion, if you're going to have anything to do with religion, there must be money in it. If he doesn't have money in it, then why are we there? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 5. 1 Timothy 6, 5. Pervert, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Uh, supposing that the more money they make and the more gain they make in the service of the Lord, the more they are recommended to the Lord and the more they are recommended before the people that actually they are serving the Lord. Don't you see the evidence I'm serving the Lord? Prosperity for them is the evidence that you're on the right path. But the Bible says, from such withdraw thyself. In verse 9 of that same chapter, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful laws which draw men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. If you find yourself loving money, Counting the thing, wanting the thing, desiring the thing, wondering when will it increase, why don't I have much more than this? And every waking thought, everything you are thinking about is, how much am I getting out of it? You are called to serve the Lord. How much will I get out of it? You are called to prepare a program. How much will I get out of it? Some people are coming to your area to plan a program. How much will I get out of it? Everything that revolves in your life, it revolves around money around what will I get, how will I make myself rich, how will I possess this, how will I have that. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. You can't keep faith and the love of money at the same time. When true faith, living faith, dynamic faith, faith in the Lord, saving faith, when it enters, love of money will go out. If the love of money comes in, you are going to make a shipwreck of your faith. Because it says in that verse 10, they have erred, they have swerved from the faith, and they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading from that verse 2, it talks of boasters. The, poster, the boasters are the people that claim the greatness which they do not possess. He brags, he exaggerates his ability, he exaggerates his talent, he exaggerates his reputation and accomplishments and his value to the church and to the society. In fact, he's a hero in his own eyes. All the other people are grasshoppers, he is the only giant. When you find a person like that, that looks down on other people, and they will not think that any other person has any other thing. They are the hero in any event. They are the hero in any story. They are the hero in any testimony. They are the hero in any program. They are the only one that can do what is there to be done. And they feel that no other person can do any other thing. That's what the Bible is talking about. It is the mark of self-centeredness in the last days in the church. And then it talks about the proud. The proud, they may seem quiet and inoffensive, but in the secret heart, there is contempt for everyone else. In fact, in the, or in the heart of the proud person, there is a little altar uh, where he bows down before himself. That means the proud person worships himself. He worships self. And he bows down at the altar of self. And then we're told of uh, blasphemers, you know that? They slander the Lord. And they slander the word of the Lord. And they slander and they disrespect holy, sacred things. It talks about being disobedient to parents. It's talking about the natural relationship between parents and children and children. It's also talking about our attitude to church authority our attitude to authority in the government. 
You know that there are many riots, uh, you know, coming up in these last days, not just in Africa, almost everywhere in the world. Because the world does not want any authority. They do not want the authority of the government. And the students do not want the authority of uh, the teachers and their principals at school. And the people who are working, the trade union, they do not want the authority of any leader, any labor leader. And the same thing is infiltrating into the church. We don't want the authority of anyone. We just feel that, uh, you know, we're all there. I can do what I want, when I want, how I want, the way it suits me. You cannot do that if you're a real child of God. It is the mark of self-centeredness in the world that is infiltrating into the church. And then it talks about the unthankful and the unholy. They never appreciate any good thing you do to them. There is never a thank you coming from them. And of course, they are unholy. All the kinds of sin you can think about, they will practice and perpetrate. It talks about without natural affection. Even the natural affection that uh, parents will have for children, we abandon those children and we go in pursuit of selfish, personal, worldly pleasure. And then it talks of truth breakers. Nobody keeps promise with anybody today. Uh, you send the uh, children to school, he has a contract with the people that paid school fees for three years or for four years, and then by the time he comes out, he's not going to keep the promise. And then you find a man and a woman coming before the altar. Do you take this man as the only man in your life? You love him. You'll take care of him. You will be with him to the exclusion of all else. Yes, I do. Will you take uh, this woman as the one you love and the only one that will be in your life until death do us part in sickness and in, uh, in health, in prosperity, in adversity, until death do us part? Oh, yes, I do. Three months after, they have divorced. And so you see, there is nobody wanting to keep any promise today. And we do it also before the Lord. We come to the Congress like this, and we hear the messages, and then we, we stand up, or we kneel down, and we cry, and we weep, and we say, Lord, give me another chance. I'm going to go back to my state. I'm going to go back to my nation. I'm going to go back to my region. And everything that is wrong, I'm going to correct. Oh, Lord, give me another chance. I will put this in place. I'll put that in place. I will do this. I will do that. We go back, and two weeks after that, we become truth breakers. We don't keep those things. We don't keep the promise of the Lord. How many conferences have we held? How many congresses have we attended? How many retreats have we held? How many times have we laid it line upon line, precept upon precept? And yet we will not obey the word of it. We will not even keep our promise to the Lord. That's what it's saying here. And it's also false accusers. And the false accusers, they are the people that share the, na the nature and the title of Satan. Because you see, that's what Satan does, is the accuser of the brethren. But most of the time you know it, it's false accusation. And the false accusers, they share the nature and the title of Satan. They are engulfed and they are blindfolded by their self-love that they do the very work of the devil, of Satan. And then he talks of the incontinent. That means the people that have no self-control. Their vehicle has no brake. If they are coming on the way, get out of the way for them. Don't say you are right. Don't say he sees me here. He sees you, but his vehicle does not have any brake. He can say anything. He can do anything. He can behave anyhow. There is no control. There is no spirit of God within him saying, A child of God should not say that. A child of God should not act like that. A child of God should not behave like that. A child of God should not treat another person like that. There is no control that checks them, that tells them that we shouldn't say that, we shouldn't go that way, we shouldn't touch that thing, we shouldn't move in that direction because the self-love has uh, blindfolded them to the point that they have lost every control over themselves. The lover of self eventually will become a slave to his passion, a slave to his ambition, and he will lose control of his life. Then we are told that they are fierce, brutal, despisers of those that are good. 
all these things will characterize the time of the last days. That is, the time in which we are living. Uh, you know then that we're living in an evil generation. In fact, in the passage we're reading, it says there'll be a generation of traitors, of heady people, of high-minded people, and then it says, well, they're going to be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Uh, if uh, you put uh, church service at the time when there is uh, football, international football, I'm not sure you are going to have all your members present there. If you put uh, even examination now, examination of school children, if it gets to the time when there is international uh, game going on, maybe Olympics or whatever, some of those children are going to forget that they had exam. They are going to uh, get a television somewhere watching those games. They are going to forget the important things of life. And uh, you know some of these young people too, that uh, they go after games and they go after these pleasures of the world and they even forget that they need regular, normal education. The games will take uh, the essential thing away from them. That's the life in which uh, we are today. But then it's not just in the world, it is also in the church. Now we're told in chapter 3, verse 5, having a form of godliness. The shell is there. The container is there. The shape is there. The denomination is there. The external paraphernalia, uh, that is the external kind of thing you see, and you say that's religion. The external religion is there. The problem is there is no grace within. There is no power for a righteous life within. It says denying the power thereof from such turn away. From such turn away. Is that a commandment or a suggestion? The reason I asked you is that there are people in our church here that are beginning to question. They are beginning to question when, uh, let's say, for example, Catholics get together and the celestial people get together, the white garment people get together, and the religious people get together, and the people that do not even believe that Jesus rose from the dead, they come together. The people that do not believe in the sinless life of Christ, they all come together, and then they call deeper life. They said, come along. We all believe in God. We all believe in Jesus as a good example, as a perfect example. He lived the example for us to follow. But they do not believe that his blood will wash us whiter than snow. And then they say, deeper life, come along. There are some people within deeper life that will say, well, don't let us make ourselves unpopular. Don't let us make ourselves unsocial. Let us, these people are coming together. Or, and they are all religious. And they believe that, uh, at least even if they don't believe the whole Bible, they believe that a uh, part of scripture is inspired. Even if they don't take everything, let's get along with them. And if those of us who still have biblical conviction, if we say no, we can not get together with them. There are some of our people that will say, are we not taking this into seriously? Are we not standing on this thing with too much rigidity? That's why I, told, I asked you whether what we see here is a suggestion or it's a command. It says they have a form of godliness. And then it said they deny the power thereof. And then it tells you there is one thing to do. There is one thing to do. It said from such people, from such organization, from such bodies, turn away. But then it means uh, this. It means that if you are a child of God, now you know the truth of the word of God, and you know that we have salvation through Jesus Christ alone, and you have a community of people. They're good-natured people. They're they are loving people. They're sociable people. They interact very well. The only problem is the very center of redemption is what they take away. They take away Christ as our savior, as our substitute, as a sacrifice that made a final sacrifice and there is no other sacrifice. They take that one away and they say, come together with us. We believe in the golden rule, do unto others as we want them to do unto you. We believe in the principles of righteousness in the New Testament. Come along with us. And then you say, how about Christ? 
as our Savior. Jesus only, Jesus ever. Jesus in all in all is our Savior, is our sanctifier, is our healer, is our baptizer, is the coming king. And you ask them, what do you say of Jesus? Oh, they say, eh, we don't like argument. If we bring in doctrine, it's going to divide us. We might as well be divided. From such, turn away. I said from such, turn away. It only means, it also means another thing. It means if there is an individual in a church, the members of the church, they believe the word of God. But there is uh, this uh, preacher now is becoming modernistic. It's becoming liberal. He does not take the word of God. He has the appearance of righteousness. He has the shell. He has the form of godliness. But he denies the power thereof. You should let your state overseer know. Because now, he is in the minority. You are in the majority. You want the word of God. And the Bible says, from such, turn away. The practical implication of that is, take him away from the pulpit. Once it subtracts Jesus Christ, the center, the savior, the sanctifier, the baptizer, the one that makes us righteous and makes it possible for us to have that life of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And it gets into just shallow, empty, watered down, diluted kind of gospel. The Bible says from search, turn away. And we take that seriously. We take it as a commandment of the Bible. Therefore, you will not allow a liberal preacher to stay there and be talking to you every Sunday and say, well, I don't like to report anybody. Although we know that he doesn't believe the totality of scripture, but uh, you, you know, he's a good man and he's doing the best he can. After all, not everybody will preach the same way. His own emphasis happens to be this, this, and that. We will, we will balance up everything by getting cases from the headquarters, even if he doesn't say the right thing. I have the cases at home. I have the literature at home. This is the scripture booklet is there. I will develop myself through the cases and leave him there on the pulpit. You know what you're doing? Although you may be able to keep the Christian life because you are able to read the word of God for yourself and you have all those cases, all the other people in the congregation, uh, they may not have that ability. Therefore, you'll be making him to send a lot of people to hell. You will pick him up. You will talk to him, and if he doesn't change, you'll have to report him, and then our leaders will remove him from there and bring somebody there that will feed over the word of God. Well, it's a battle. It's very difficult to raise up a godly church in the last days because the characteristics of the last days will be trying to infiltrate into the church, and we who are in leadership will be fighting back, saying, no, it cannot be. No, it cannot be. Well, I wish the fight were not there. But what can we do? The fight is there. And uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. And if you are a leader, you cannot be a friend to everybody. I wish I could be a friend to everybody, but it's impossible for me. Since God gave me this responsibility, I have to offend some few people. Maybe I have to offend many, many people. But it's not a time of friendship. It's a time of spiritual warfare. And we're going to fight against the devil. We're going to fight against false doctrine. If it comes into any deeper life pulpit, we're going to fight against it. Because that's what the word of God says. That you will turn away from such. And then it says in verse 6, For of day such are they which creep into houses and lead captive uh, silly women laden with sins, led away with divers laws, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, those were the magicians that withstood Moses in the land of Egypt, so do these also resist the truth. You see, that's the problem. They want religion. They don't want sound doctrine. They want religion. They do not want the truth. And then it says, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. For they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men as theirs also was. That tells us truth will prevail. Truth will prevail. We're fighting a battle which, by the grace of God, we have won already. 
Jesus Christ has won already and we are on the side of Christ and we are by the grace of God the winning team in Jesus name truth is going to conquer error light is going to conquer darkness sound doctrine is going to displace false doctrine and if you are for the truth of the word of God I congratulate you stand by your post you are going to win the day in Jesus name I go to point number two in point number two we have the model for saints in God's service model for saints in God's service I'm reading from verse 10 but thou hast fully known my doctrine manner of life purpose faith long-suffering charity patience persecution afflictions here Paul the apostle gives himself as a model that will be all right there's nothing wrong for a father in the family to call his children and say children you see what your father is doing you see the lifestyle of your father look at me I'm your father follow what I'm doing that's perfectly all right there is nothing wrong for an apostle like Paul to say, follow me as I follow Christ, perfectly in line with scripture. There is nothing wrong for a pastor if you are saved and you are living the life and you know that you are following a path that other people ought to follow. And if you know you are leading a life that other people should not follow, quit the ministry. You do not have a right to be in the ministry if you cannot tell the followers and the people that you are leading to look at everything you are doing and follow on. It's the right. In fact, it is the duty and the responsibility of a leader to tell the other people that are following that by the grace of God, the grace of God that appeared unto all men, it has appeared unto me, teaching me to deny ungodliness and worldly laws and to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. The grace of God has touched my life. What I'm preaching to you, I'm demonstrating by the life I live. Follow my example. And so you find here Timothy being told by his mentor, being told by the model, being told by Paul the Apostle, and he was saying, now Timothy, have you seen my life? Have you seen my experiences? Have you seen my doctrine? Have you seen everything that I laid down as an example? I want you to see these things and follow. He gives us nine things here. Look at them from verse 10. Number one, my doctrine. Number two, my manner of life. Number three, my purpose. Number four, my faith. Number five, long suffering. Number six, charity. Number seven, patience. Number eight, persecution. Number nine, afflictions. And these nine characteristics and qualities are divided into three categories. The first category is uh, bring us to the ministry duties the ministry duties the second category godly virtues and the third category is you have difficult experiences look at them one by one the ministry duties doctrine manner of life purpose and then the godly virtues faith long-suffering charity patience it's difficult experiences, persecution, affliction. Its doctrine was precisely the whole counsel of God. It's not a partial doctrine. It is not that, well, the doctrine God has given me to emphasize is healing and deliverance. Nothing like that in the Bible. We're given the whole counsel of God and we're to preach the whole counsel of God. He was to commit that same counsel of God unto faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. There's something beautiful about Paul the Apostle which should, be, which should have been reflected in the life of Timothy and which should be reflected in your life and in my life. Paul's manner of life was consistent with his teaching. Where we get into problem is we teach well and we live in a bad way. 
that gets us, that gets the church, the ministry into problem. But when you realize that the manner of life of Paul the Apostle was consistent with his teaching, and that that is the same thing you are to do, that's the same thing I am to do. He had a godly purpose. He had Christ-like motive. He had a driving passion to exalt Christ, like we had this morning. And he was seeking only the glory of the Lord for Paul, for Timothy, and for you and for me. This combination of doctrine and manner of life and purpose is imperative for effective ministry. You cannot take doctrine alone and run with it. You cannot say, I don't want to get uh, involved with doctrine, I don't want to get involved with argument, I don't want to get involved with uh, teaching the uh, doctrine, all I want to have is just a manner of life. That's not sufficient either. The combination of doctrine and manner of life and purpose, all that combination is imperative for effective ministry. Godly virtues were inseparable, inseparably part of Paul's life. And they were mentioned next. He talked about faith. That is faith in all the promises of God. Faith in God himself. It's a kind of faith that knows who God is. That knows what God can do. That knows also what he can do through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ living, abiding in him. We need that kind of faith. Not only that, he had long suffering resolute persistent spirit keeping him in uncompromising devotion to his lord and to the work of the kingdom and then he had charity walking in love he ministered in love and then he remained patient patient with two things number one patient with difficult people patient with difficult people number two patient with difficult circumstances and now he talks about his difficult experiences in the ministry. And you'll see what he mentions in verse 11. He says, Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at, at, at um, Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Amen. Out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Now, when we talk about the difficult experiences of Paul the Apostle, do I need to remind you that he became converted on the road to Damascus? He got to Damascus, he spent a few days, and then he began to publicize that Jesus is the Christ. And right at that time, very close to the time of his conversion, he began to suffer persecution. And then he came out of that place, and everywhere he went, persecution followed after him. He went to the synagogue, and he said, Hey, help men of Israel. This is a man that has taught men everywhere to forsake the law of Moses. And they almost lynched him. On the street, they stoned him. By the seaside, uh, the snake came around uh, his hand, and then he threw it away. And they, they said, This man must have been a criminal. To the very time of his death, he said, I'm now in chains, I'm in bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Have you seen the experience of Paul the Apostle? From the very time of his conversion, persecution and affliction were almost his constant companions. And yet, he never gave up. Yet, he never gave up. Whatever persecutions we have, we will not give up. He had a calm temper that suffered without murmuring. He suffered without discontent. He was a man of great courage and of great resolution. He endured persecution faithfully, and he said, the Lord delivered him out of them all. Now you ask the question, what was the motivating factor for this Paul the Apostle to continue just ministering and ministering and ministering in the face of such great dangers? Look at it in chapter 3 now. Reading from verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He said, there's no way to avoid it. In fact, even if you are not an apostle, even if you are not a prophet, 
even if you are not called to be an evangelist even if you are not a pastor teacher there is no way you can avoid persecution if you are going to live godly in christ jesus all that will live godly in christ jesus shall suffer persecution we don't have time this morning i think what we could have done is uh, to ask a question one by one and say uh, in the past uh, in the passing year that is the year that just passed by did you experience any persecution at all in your office in your home in the extended family in the church among the denominational people in your town was there any persecution at all if you say yes we'll say come to this side if you say no we'll say come to this side and then we go through everyone one by one and we'll say you didn't have any persecution the or the last year the uh, friends of uh, the world they loved you the children of the devil they loved you the idol worshippers they spoke well of you and all those religious uh, people white garment people holy water people candle burning people incense burning people they were clapping for you and everybody loved you and they invited you to all their ceremonies and you are eating and drinking come to this other side and then all the people on this other side were said you didn't have any persecution last year at all get on your knees and pray for salvation because you see what the word of God is saying. It's saying all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why? Because things are not going to get better. Things are going to get worse. In verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I pray they will not deceive you. Now he told Timothy, he said, Timothy, you know, as the world is going upside, is going upside down, as the persecution is going on, as the deceivers are deceiving people, and they themselves are being deceived, and false religions and uh, false ministries are rising up every day and every week in your community. Timothy, remember this, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And now, I want to tell you that uh, Paul the Apostle knew that was soon he was about to go. He was about to leave this world. He was about to die. And then he told Timothy, he said, Timothy, I'm telling you something. Things are going to become harder. Things are going to become tougher. But you continue in the things that you have learned. And then after I have gone, you will always remember, call to mind, knowing the person you learned that thing from. Anytime you suffer persecution, think about me. Paul said that I also went through that. And then you'll say, if my pastor, if my leader, if my mentor, if he went through that, I can go through it. If he overcame, I can overcome. We know that Jesus Christ is a perfect example. But you understand that Jesus Christ had no sin nature. You understand? Jesus Christ was God and man at the same time. You understand? Jesus Christ was eternal and is still eternal. You understand that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, is the Savior. And sometimes, although we look at him as our perfect example, and that's legitimate and normal, but when I see flesh and blood like myself, when I see somebody that was born in sin, like myself. When I see somebody that was weak by human nature, like myself. And I see what grace has done in him. I look at Enoch. I look at Daniel. I look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I look at Samuel. I look at those worthies of all. The flesh and blood, like myself. The people that were weak by nature, like myself. I look at Paul the Apostle. And I say, if Paul the Apostle could do that, all by the grace of God then I can when you say it's Jesus Christ we know it is Jesus but you know many times I'll fall back and I'll say well I'm just a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ he is Christ he is king of kings he is the lord of lords but when i look at paul that he is not lord of lords he is not king of kings and he was able to do it and he went through then i say if paul could do it i believe you can do it I said, I believe you can do it. So that's why he was telling Timothy, he was saying, continue. Continue thou in the things thou hast learned. 
and has been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now we come to point number three as we conclude. It's the ministry of scriptures in the church. The ministry of scriptures in the church. It says in verse 15 that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy was privileged to have known the holy scriptures from his youth, from his childhood. His father seemed to have failed in the God-given responsibility of bringing him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But what the father failed to do, his mother and grandmother had done effectively. That's why uh, we women, we shouldn't say, well, the man, that's his responsibility. It's like the priest in the family. It's like the pastor of the family. It's like the worship leader of the family. And so if the father is not doing it, then we women mothers will fold our hands and then the children will not have any upbringing in the things of the Lord. We cannot do it like that. If the father is failing, the Lord will question the father and the Lord will deal with the father at his own time in his own way. But you pick up that challenge and that responsibility and teach the child the way of the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we read it before, look at it again. And in verse 5, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that is in thee also. So it was the mother and the grandmother that taught him the scriptures that he knew. That's why he said in chapter 3 and in verse 15, From a child has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What we're saying is, it's the responsibility now of every family to raise up children, godly children, so that God will not bring judgment upon us like he brought upon Eli because of not training his children in the way of the Lord. And as a church too, we ought to have a ministry that will develop children, a ministry that will develop young people so that we'll be able to raise up Joseph's. Raise up Daniels, raise up people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and raise up Jeremiah's that will know the Lord and even be serving the Lord from their youth. That's the responsibility the Lord has given unto us. Now he concludes by telling us the ministry of the scriptures. And he said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Before I comment on that verse, I want you to please notice very carefully. Look at that little word, is. If you take that little word, is, and you change the position of that word, is, and then you say, all scripture given by inspiration is profitable. What you have done is to say the scriptures that are inspired of God are profitable. And then you begin to tell us some of those things you find in the Bible are not really the words of God. They are not inspired of God, so those ones are not profitable. And then you now give us a chance to set up a committee. For us to decide, you tell us the ones you feel are inspired. Because only those ones that are inspired will be profitable for doctrine. Another person then will rise up and tell us that part is not inspired. And then we cut off some parts. And we say that cannot be acceptable. That's too much of out of the ordinary. It doesn't fit into scientific knowledge. And therefore, that couldn't have been right. When you change the position of that word is, which is what some versions of the Bible, what they have done. And they just say, all scripture that is given by inspiration is profitable. 
And then you just take, and then they tell you that the reason you have these new versions is because the English is simpler. And you see the English of the King James Version is the old, old English. And the average person will not understand. Because of that, they deceive the simple-minded people and give a watered-down thing into their hand. And then we now read and we say, all oh, scripture that is inspired of God is profitable. No, keep it the way it is. All scripture, from cover to cover. The ones we understand, the ones we don't understand. The ones that uh, critical science is still figuring out how it can be, how it cannot be. Everything, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All, not part, not most part of it. Everything is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration in the original. It means it is breathed out. In fact, in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, it is the same Greek word that is used when it says God made man in his, he made man in his image. He made man out of the dust of the earth. And then he breathed into him, breathing out into him to become a living soul. Exactly the same word that is used. As God breathed into man and he became a living soul, God breathed out the scripture. That's why I'll be afraid to tamper with the outbreezed scripture, with the word of God, coming from the innermost part of God, coming from the center of the being of God. Whether you understand or you don't understand, you treat this as something sacred. It's above man because it came out of man. All scripture is breathed out by God. And then he tells us it is profitable. All scripture is profitable that means it's not just part of scripture it's talking about both old testament and new testament when it says all scripture there are some people that don't teach from the old testament at all or they feel that those things were given as uh, symbols as types and they are fulfilled already therefore they will not go to the old testament but it says all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine I want to show you a peculiar example just to explain the point. In 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Reading from verse 18. It says, For the scripture says, Thou shalt not muscle the ox that treadeth out corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If you take this uh, verse at face value, it's saying the scripture says, he mentions the first part of what he wants to quote that the scripture says. And then he mentions the second part of what he says the scripture says. Now, the first part, the scripture says, Thou shalt not muscle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Where do we find that? It's in Deuteronomy chapter 25. Please look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4. Thou shalt not muscle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. And Paul the apostle in quoting that, he said, it is scripture. What does that say? It's telling us that the Old Testament is scripture. Now, look at the latter part of that verse 18. The laborer is worthy of his reward. Where do you find that? You find that in Luke chapter 10 and in verse 7. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 7. And the same in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Can you see what Paul the Apostle is telling us by the inspiration of the Spirit of God? He quotes the Old Testament. He said the Scripture says. He quotes the words of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, and he says the Scripture says. Which means it brings together the old and the new, brings everything together, and it says it is scripture. And so, when we're talking of scripture, we're talking of the totality of the word in the old as well as in the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times 
and in diverse manners spake in time past to our fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. What's he telling us? Verse 1 is talking about the Old Testament. And he said, God spoke. That's Old Testament. He spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He's talking about the New Testament in verse 2, and he's still saying it is still God speaking, only that the method or the channel of communication is now changed, has now changed. As in these last days, spoken unto us, is still God speaking unto us by his Son. Which means then, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, they are part of Scripture. In First Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, from verse uh, 13. For this cause also thank we God, without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye had of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. He was talking about their preaching from the Old Testament, Old Covenant. And he said, when you receive the preaching we give you, explaining, interpreting, applying the old covenant, old testament to you, you received it as the word of God. In Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. And reading from verse uh, 16. And also in all his epistles, talking about Paul the Apostle, speaking in things, speaking in them of things in which there are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable, they rest, they twist, they distort, as they do also other scriptures to their own destruction. You see what the word of God is saying here? It's putting all the epistles of Paul the Apostle as part of scripture. It's saying the people that are learned, they twist, they distort, they rest those scriptures as they do other scriptures. He brings in the writing of James and Jude and everybody else in the New Testament and he says they are scriptures too. The ones that Paul the Apostle wrote, they are scriptures. And the ones that the other people wrote, they are scriptures. You have seen then the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Gospels, the Epistles and everything. They form the scriptures all together. And now we are told the ministry of that scripture. We conclude with uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter, sorry, chapter 3, reading from verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable. Is the scripture profitable? It is profitable. It's profitable for doctrine. There is no other place you go to find material for developing doctrine and establishing doctrine. It's only in the word of God. It's also profitable for reproof. When somebody has done something wrong and you bring that person face to face with scripture, and you say, look at what you have done. Look at what the scripture says. Compare. And then he sees the difference between what he has done and what the scripture has said he is reproved. And then it's for correction. It is for correction. So that as he repents, he will be restored. And for instruction in righteousness that the man of God. You know that he's referring to the ministers as the man of God. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 11, he had referred to Timothy, he said, Thou man of God. Referring to Timothy, and by extension referring to all the people that are serving in the vineyard of the Lord. And that the man of God may be perfect, that means accomplished and complete, thoroughly furnished, thoroughly equipped unto all good works. My challenge to you in this new year is to become newly committed to the Word of God. As if today, for the first time, you are given a gift from God, and He says, I give you this. Keep to it. It will take you, it will bring you to me eventually. It's the greatest gift that you can ever have. It reveals God to us. It reveals the plan of redemption. It shows us the love and the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. It reveals the mysteries of the kingdom of God. 
it is the one that tells us about the plan of redemption it is the one that shows us how we can be free from sin how we can become holy without which no man shall see the lord it is a sin that tells us about heaven it's the sin that tells us about a hell that we need to escape it's a sin that shows us that if we live the life according to this word now eventually we'll be with the lord all sorrows will be over all problems will be over all conflict will be over it is this word that will take you from here and transport you to heaven you have a bible in your hand i said you have a bible in your hand stand up and raise up that bible and you are going to get that bible as if you have never read the bible before as if you are taking the bible as a new gift from the lord as if you are saying oh lord i didn't know there is so much in this world i didn't appreciate this word before i now take it as a gift from the lord i will read it i will study it i will memorize it i will apply it to my life i will do everything i can to teach it to other people i will defend the doctrines of the bible i will stand by the bible i will stay by the promises of the bible and the bible will stay by me i will never part with the bible i and my bible my bible and i we're on a journey together and we're going to heaven together nothing will part me from my bible anything that will come between me and my bible will have to get away from my life oh lord i thank you you have given me a gift of your word i will stand by it i will hold on to it the bible will be my constant companion from earth to heaven i and my bible i and my bible my bible and i we're going together we're going together sin will not take the bible from me worldliness will not take the bible from me discipline will not take the bible from me all the money in the world will not take the bible from me the pleasures of the world will not take the bible from me the bible is a treasure to me it's a gift of god unto me i love it i love it i love it I appreciate it. I embrace it. I accept it. I will read it. I will study it. I will meditate on it. I will not allow anything to take this Bible from me. I make a covenant with the Lord. I will never depart. I will never deviate from the jo every jot, every title in this word of the Lord. I will stay with the Bible. I will stay with the Bible. Any church that will uh, put down the Bible, I will get out of that church. Any ministry that will not appreciate the Bible, any ministry that will not stay with the Bible, I will have to quit that ministry. The Bible will be my constant companion from now until I see the Lord face to face. Appreciate it. Love it. Give yourself to it. Commit yourself to the study of the Bible. It's the scripture. It's the holy writing. It's the word of God. It's the word of the Almighty. There is nothing else like it. There is nothing else like it. There is nothing else like it. The Lord has given it to you so that that thing in your hand can bring you to heaven. It will reveal Jesus to you. It will reveal the grace of God to you. Stay with it. Stand by it. Defend it. Read it. Teach it. Preach it. Emphasize it anywhere, everywhere you go. Anywhere they will not allow you to preach the Bible, get out of that place. Anywhere they will not give false place to the Bible, in the worship, in the assembly, get out of that place. Stay with that covenant. Don't be a covenant breaker. Don't be somebody that will promise the Lord now and then two weeks.